study Tuesdays, let's stand and invite our Lord to be with us. Yeah. Precious, wonderful Lord, we give you all the praise, all the thanks. Lord God, we just honor you and we bless you. We thank you, O oh God, that you are in our lives, that you lead us, you guide us, O oh God, that you never leave us, you never forsake us. Lord God, it is a great privilege to live and to know you, O oh God, and to be known by you. And precious Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. And Father, we're going to feast on it this evening, Lord, because you always lay it out to us so that we could eat, Father God, that we could receive, that we could digest, and it could change our lives, Father. We just bless you and we honor you, and we ask Holy Spirit, take full control of this time. And Lord, write the words upon our hearts, O oh God, that we will not forget them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God, you may be seated. So welcome today to Bible Study Tuesday. It's always a pleasure to be here, best day of the week for me. So we're continuing our study, Understanding Salvation, um, the study of Galatians and related scriptures. So um, last week we covered Galatians chapter 3 and verse 20. Basically 20 because we kind of spoke around 20 which speaks about um, Moses being the mediator between God and Israel and um, where the law was concerned and then it goes into speaking about you know um, what the mediator is that the mediator has to be between not just it could never be a mediator of one person it has to be mediator between two right so we looked at Jesus as the only mediator between us and God. Um, and as a sinful high priest, he's the only one qualified to go to God on our behalf. So we looked a lot at Jesus as high priest, um, being mediator, and we saw that he was high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And we saw what that meant, because it meant that he was not just priest, but also king. And as king and priest, he just wore all the hats, everything that we needed to be pardoned and everything was because of Jesus being high priest and king at the same time. We looked at the cities of refuge. You remember we spoke about the cities of refuge because I was showing you how the, what the role of the priest would have been for the city of refuge and what the role of the king would be. And Jesus covered both of those for us. So he himself is our city of refuge. Yeah, which is exciting stuff. So today, we are going to finish chapter 3. Yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> that's the plan. We're going to finish chapter 3. But, you know, before we get there, I just want to say something else on the mediator. You know, because we did talk about Jesus Christ being the only mediator. Just to refresh our memories, First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, For there is one God... And one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. It didn't leave it up for us to figure out who that mediator might be, or if we could just decide on who our mediator will be. You know, you decide, you know, I'll just choose a mediator. No, he told you who the mediator is. And he says, it's the man Christ Jesus. He says, who gave himself a ransom for all. So he earned that place to be a mediator. So I just wanted to expound a little bit more on that, just to bring out the meaning, because what happens if we fail to use a designated mediator? Now, if you, are, you have some kind of situation and you're trying to get agreement between two parties and so on, you have a mediator. If you choose not to use the mediator, let's say it's even in the case because a lawyer could stand as a mediator, they're speaking on your behalf. If you choose... Um, not to use the designated mediator, your request may not be heard. You know? In fact, it, it wouldn't be heard. The judge don't want to talk to you because there was a designated mediator. Yeah? There's someone. And so if somebody is supposed to be speaking on your behalf, so when you think about it, we won't even get an audience with God without the designated mediator. And I'm saying designated because, as I said, he said there's only one. You know, so when we say things like in Christianity, we say that, you know, um, there's only one way, you know, that Jesus Christ is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. People feel like, why you just wonder, uh, you know, that's only one, it's only one. But God makes it very clear in the scriptures, yeah, that it is, is one. He makes one way 
for you to go. He makes one mediator. So you have to use that person or else you just cannot be heard. So approaching God without a mediator. I was just thinking about it and I said, it, you know, it's like being in a foreign country and you don't know the language and you decide to just talk to everybody without a translator. You know what will happen? They will just be looking at you like a crazy person and being like, I'm hearing your voice, but I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah? I don't know what you're saying. But, you know, because God is holy. And when you think about it, I know everybody treats God as though God is their pal. And, you know, he's just your friend next door kind of thing. But God really is a holy God. And he has set things in place because he knows that we, as sinful, flawed man, really cannot be in his presence without the mediator. Yeah? Because our mediator, in this case, our mediator is like a, a shield between us and God. You know how the scripture says that God is a consuming fire? Literally, because of who we are in this state, you go before God, you could be consumed. Yeah? I know we, I know we don't believe things like that, but Hebrews tells you that. Hebrews, where? Hebrews 12 and verse 29, it says that our God is a consuming fire. Yeah, and just last night I was reading, last night or this morning, I was reading about um, Nadab, is it Nadab, Nahum, Nadab and Abihu, they were Aaron's sons, and they went before the altar and they offered up strange fires, now that's a whole message by itself, it's strange fires, I'm not going to get into it, but the fire of God came, and consume them when they did not do it according to God's way. The fire of God just came and, and consumed them and that was it. And, and Moses even told, he, he told Aaron, when Aaron was probably waking up to, to probably cry for his sons, he said, this is exactly what God said, you know, do it God's way or else you could end up being consumed. And I was chatting with a friend today and she was saying that, you know, reading some church reading something in Kings. And when she started, when you didn't do things the way that, you know, the way that God laid out, people would just drop and die. Like, you know, like how user think they would, you know, he, he touched the ark and, you know, that was it. You didn't even get to say, okay, God, well, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to touch it. Give me another chance. You touch the ark, you're not supposed to touch it, you're dead. Right? And she was saying that helped her so much to understand grace. Because we live under grace. The amount of nonsense we do, how is it that we just didn't drop dead? Because we're not under the law. <laughs> you see, we're under grace. You cannot abuse grace, yeah, because the Lord can still break forth upon you, right? You cannot abuse grace. But because of grace, because of this great mediator that we have, we actually are able to still stand even though we don't do things according to the, to the word of God, you know? Um... But God is a holy God, and we being sinful man, there's a scripture in Habakkuk chapter 1, um, verse 13, it says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. That's just the first part of it. So when you look at that, it's not that God can't see it. Of course, he could see all things. But God, he, his, because of his pure eyes, he cannot tolerate, he cannot embrace, he cannot allow the iniquity. His very being will consume. Yeah? And so this is why even there was a time when he told Moses, he says, I'm not going to go up with you all, you know. He says, because you all are stiff-necked people, and I will end up consuming you all on the way. You, know, you remember that scripture? Yeah, he said, I could end up consuming you all on the way. I think it's um, Exodus 33. He said, he said, I could end up consuming you all. You know? So... Because of the nature of who God is, Jesus Christ came and he became the mediator for us. So, when they said that it's one mediator, one person who could stand between us and God, he had to qualify for it. Because in the realm of the spirit, you have to enter through a name. If you have to get into the realms of God, you have to enter through a name. You know like how some people, they will say, you know, I know somebody working such and such a place. I could put you onto them. When you go there, tell them I sent you. What are they doing? They're using your name. 
right? They're using your name because when the person hears that so-and-so sent you, immediately they're able to look back on what's the relationship that I have with that person, you know? So you're now dealing with the person that they sent as if they themselves they, they themselves came because that person is a friend you have a relationship with them there's a trust there's a whatever so when to get into the realms of god yeah you you could only do so by a name but the name had to be authenticated yeah and this is what jesus christ did his name became authenticated yeah so um Let me see. Right. So it, it says relationship. So when you, when you speak, to speak to God only, you could speak to God only through the authority of that name. And Jesus said that. People feel like you could, do, you could go with your own name. Our, our name has no power. It has no weight. Worse yet, in the realm of, of heaven, has no weight. You cannot go in your own name. You cannot go in the name of Peter, Paul, Nobody, even though they did great things, great men of God, you cannot go in the name of Moses. Yeah? Because the only one who qualified as a mediator was Jesus Christ, right? So we cannot enter by our own name because God says, but do, do you know that when we get to heaven, eventually God gives us a new name? The name we have now represents our sinful life. It represents all of this. But when you look in Revelation, I think Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17, that's it's a, one of the churches that um, Jesus spoke with. He told them, he said that you will get a new name. He says he will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth save, saving he that receiveth it. What does a new name do? The new name says who you are now. Your old name represents who you were, right? That's like Jacob, all of them who have got new names. Abraham, who was Abram before. Sarai became Sarah and all of that. The new name that they got said now who they were. But when we get to heaven, we all get new names, yeah? We all get new names. So Jesus said that you can speak to the Father, but only in my name. And that's the power of the mediator. John chapter 16, verse 23. There's just one of them. Quite a few scriptures said that, you know, you could speak to the Father in his name. It says, and in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father how, in my name he will give it you. Why? Because the name of Jesus is mediating for us. Jesus himself, through the power of his name, is mediating for us. He is the go-between us and God because us with God alone could be consumed in the state that we are now. So, as I said, his name stands as a shield between us and God. And the scripture says... Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, you could take a note of this. It says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name, not another name, under heaven, given among men whereby we must be saved. And when you're thinking about salvation, yet you cannot be saved from your sin by any other name. But you can't be saved from anything except by the name of Jesus. Yeah? Because salvation, being saved, is deliverance on a whole. So your soul gets delivered, for your flesh to be delivered. Everything, deliverance on a whole, is by the name of Jesus, right? So prayers will not be heard through any other name. So you could pray and pray in another name, and it would not be heard. And I'm making the point because I didn't want us to miss how important it is to recognize Jesus as mediator. Because we have to do things God's way, right? So just think about it. If you cannot pray in Paul's name, you can't pray in Peter's name, you can't pray in James or John's name, none of them, not even Moses, you can't pray in Abraham's name. I know people touch you with this, but you cannot pray in Mary's name. Yeah? And you can't, you can't pray in her name, neither can you pray to her. We can't pray to Paul or Peter or anybody and tell them, go and talk to Jesus first because the scripture says there's one mediator. So this is why when you look at the, the, um, the throne of grace that's set up, he says you could come boldly before the throne of grace where you could find help you know, for, in time of need, right? 
But that, what does that represent? Remember, they could not, in times past, they could not approach unto the um, Holy of Holies in that area because the, the throne of grace really is representative of what the Ark of the Covenant and so that was in the Holy of Holies where only one priest could have gone in to mediate for the people. And now he says, you could come boldly, directly to the throne of grace, which represents Jesus Christ. You're coming through him and talking to God, right? He's the only one. So you don't have to go through anybody else to get to God. Now, and I, and I have to say it, the whole thing about, you know, praying to Mary and all of that, it's, it, man came up with that, you know? They used that scripture where she said, you know, go to my son and, you know, whatever he, he tells you, do it. They used that to feel like you could pray to her. But you cannot be praying to people who are not authorized mediators. That is like choosing your own mediator and deciding that God must hear you or the judge must hear you when you choose an unauthorized um, mediator. They'll just dismiss you. They're not going. It's not that they can't hear you. No. They're not going to listen. Will not listen. So God is not going to listen to anybody except the authorized mediator. You know, when you think about this whole thing about praying to your people who have gone on before, right? The, the whole thing with saints. I remember um, being in that, in that religion and... You know, you're hearing about the saints and all these things. And I remember when I started to read my Bible. And then I started to see, you see, because if you never read past the Gospels, you could miss some stuff. But when I started to get into the letters, and I see they're saying, to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in this way. I'm like, who are the saints? You know, it, it confused me. So I started to put question marks by every time it said saints. I was like, who, who are these saints? Right? And then as I continued reading, you start to realize, wait a minute. So all of the people who were believers in Jesus Christ were considered saints. So then I realized, I said, but so if I am a saint, you can't pray to me when I, when I die? You know, simple, simple logic. You're looking at it because it, it was confusing. Yeah, so but you, you know that they have whole religions based on praying to your ancestors. Whole religions, that's what they do. So, that is God said, if you want to speak to me and communicate with me, I have one mediator that has been designated, which is Jesus Christ. And people try to talk to their ancestors to get help, which has nothing to do with God. Yeah, Asian religions. They, they talk to ancestors. African religions talk with uh, ancestors. Hispanics, a lot of these religions, they talk, they deal with ancestors, right? And they, when they feel that they're dealing with ancestors, what they're really doing is they're engaging with demonic entities, familiar spirits who know how to come and tell you things like if your granny talking to you and this one talking to you. And in these African and Asian religions, they, they literally sometimes, they, they cross over. They cross the veil. They have rituals that they do where they bury them or, or whatever. They have different things that they do. When they go and they tie up their eyes and whatever and thing, and they go on the ground. People know what they're talking about, right? They travel in the spirit and they're meeting people. They're meeting people who are supposed to be the ancestors and they're inviting these people to go with them. And, they, and this is where they come back with, with the spirit guides and the, all these things. It's a whole demonic kingdom. Yeah? So just think about it. We would look at those things and say, wow, how come you're talking to ancestors? Yet we want to be talking to Mary. You understand? Talking to Mary or somebody who has gone on before because you choose out certain people to deify, but it's the same kind of thing. God never designated that we are to pray and ask anybody to intercede for us. The Bible tells us of two intercessors, and it's really one, right? Holy Spirit intercedes for us. 
Jesus intercedes for us. Yeah? Even though angels are ministering spirits, the scriptures still tell you that you are not to, you don't pray to angels. Yeah? You don't ask them to go to God for anything for you. You don't do that because there's one mediator, one person that was authorized to mediate for us. So to give us a little idea of how this whole thing, if you have a legal system in place, and that's what God has in place, a legal system, you can't just barge in there and decide that um, you come by whatever name. Remember this on the skiver? We adjure you in the name of Jesus who Paul preached. And the demons kind of like, who Paul preach? We don't know you. Wh- what name are you actually coming in? Because you're trying to use Jesus' name as a key, but you don't even know the name. You're coming in the name of the same Jesus fella who Paul was talking about. The demon was like, this. it is insulting. You coming to try to cast us out in the name of some fella that you don't even know? Rip off their clothes. Send them running naked, right? Because there are laws in the spiritual kingdom. And so you have to know that the only one authorized. So you could be praying, 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 praying. Praying through a different person, a different name. And God does not have to hear you. He does not have to respond. Because he designated one mediator. So I was, when I was thinking about this, I remembered Queen Esther. And you remember... You could read the whole book of Esther. All those people would be like, I don't know what to read. I don't know what to read. Go and read Esther now. <laughs> yeah? So you always, have, you always have ideas of what to read. Go read Esther. But Esther became queen for all the reasons. Remember, I spoke about Vashti last week. Vashti misbehaved. And so the king had to look for another wife. And that is how Esther got in. And Esther is there. And she all prettied up and everything. And then trouble came for Esther's people. The Jewish people. And Esther is in the palace. So her uncle came to her and said, Esther, you're going to have to be the one. You're going to have to speak up for your people because we are in trouble here with the king. And listen to, I'm just going to read part of the account. This is Esther chapter 4, verse 11. Here it says, it says, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know, because when... Let me just tell you the other little piece. When he told her that she has to go and speak up for them, in other words, he's telling her, you're going to have to go and approach the king and let him know what is going on. That is a man who devised this whole thing against the Jewish people and you're going to have to, you know, stand, stand in the gap kind of for your, for your people. Again, you're mediating, right? For your people. And so she is telling her uncle, she say, you know what you're asking me to do? Right? This is a dangerous thing. She said, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. She said, if I go approaching the king's court, into the inner court, and the king didn't call me, there's a law in place that if he looks and he says, who's that coming in here in my presence, and I didn't call them, and he just decided not to lift that scepter, he doesn't even have to say, kill them. There's a law in place that will just activate once they do that. Yeah? And so she said, that's a dangerous thing. When you look at um, Esther 5 and 1 to 3, it says, now it came to pass. So it was a dangerous thing. And we know the story. She ended up telling them, fast with me for three days. And she said, you know, if I perish, I perish. But she she was going to do this thing to go before the king. It says, From verse 1 of chapter 5, it says, Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house. Because he's royalty. You see, we have to understand that our God is royalty. All right? It's in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so that when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. 
And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, what wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. So she got favor. And she was able to talk to the king and tell him, you know, what she had on her heart. But I was sharing this, really, because it came to mind. When you just think about, we want to just barge into the courts of heaven, not acknowledging the only mediator, acknowledging the power of the name of Jesus Christ that earned us even an entrance to come in to talk to the, to, to the Father. Yet we expect him to just give us the golden scepter, yeah, to come in. If an earthly king, they can have this measure of regard for the way that things are done. His ways. Yeah? They had to acknowledge the king's ways. If you decide to do your own thing, you will get wiped out. So how it is that we feel that we don't have to acknowledge God's way of doing it. We want to do it our own way. Because we feel that God is our pal and our friend. If he says you can only come to me through Jesus Christ, that's your only way. Yeah? You can't come up with your own people. Amen? Yeah. So I pray that that's not offensive to anyone, but I wish that, you know, back in the day when I was there, I wish somebody explained to me that there was only one mediator. You know, only one person that I need to talk to, to talk to God. Yeah? And the thing is, we even have, we have the benefit of speaking to the Father. We can still speak to the Father just through the weight of the name of Jesus because his name is that mediator for us. We could only channel through him. Yeah? And what he has established, not on our own. And I wish that somebody would have told me that because then I would know that you just hear blabbing, blabbing, blabbing and there's no authorization <laughs> to go forward. Yeah? Must be in the name of Jesus. Amen? Okay, so on to our study for today. So that was just the sideline because I just felt I wanted to say a little bit more about this whole mediating. So we'll read from Galatians 3 and 20 and move on through the rest of the verses that we're going to finish today. <laughs> yeah? So Galatians 3 and verse 20. It says, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? Now remember, I was telling you, the reason why he was explaining this whole thing with the law and the promise and all of that was to show how different the promises are from the law. The law was there by itself. It had to come in because of the transgressions of men and all these things. But the promise is what everything was really supposed to be hinged on. And he was showing you that law and promise, they, have, they really have nothing much to do with each other, right? Except this, it asks the question, is the law then against the promises of God? And he says, God forbid. He says, absolutely not. The laws are not against the promise. He says, for if there had been a law given, which could have given life, Verily or truly, righteousness should have been by the law. If the law could have released life, then you would have, it, we wouldn't need anything else. He says, but the promise, the promises of God, that's where the life is. So you have to leave off the law now and embrace the promise. The law was there for its season, but it could not give you what you need for eternal life. There's no eternal life in the law. Which is why afterward when Jesus went down into the grave, they said he went and he preached to those who were in prison and all of that because they had to now hear the truth and get an opportunity to accept the promise. Right? Because they grew up under the law. They didn't grow up under the promise. So they got an opportunity then. Right? But it says... If there was a law that could give you life, it would have been that. So it's not like if the law was there to fight the promise or to think it wasn't supposed to be a competition. It's just for them to realize, remember the Jews, because they came up under the law, they held on to it as though that was their baby. They, you know, the law is our thing. That is what qualifies us before God. Do not try to take this away from us. 
That is how they were. And he's telling them, there's no real competition. The law had its time. Embrace the promise. Right? And so he went on to say in verse 22, he says, but the scripture, right? So it's not a fight between law and promise. He says, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. What is he saying? He said, the scripture has concluded all under sin, meaning everybody, whether you're on the law, whether you are Gentile, whatever, everybody has now been concluded as a sinner. You could imagine what it sounded like to the Jews who felt that they were being justified all the time by the law. And now you're telling them, you are a sinner. Your sin was only covered, but you kept that guilt of sin every year. You, you know, when I was reading that, I find that so, so wonderful. When you come and you accept the Lord, the beauty and the lightness and everything that you feel is because you feel the weight of sin lift off of your life. If you're, if you're genuinely born again, if you're genuinely, you know, said that prayer. I'm not talking about those who come and cry a few crocodile tears at the altar because they wanted to make sure that the girls see that they cry some tears and they accept Jesus. Not that kind of thing. But when you genuinely accept the Lord, there is a weight that lifts off of your life. I, I, could, I could remember that day as if it was yesterday because it was the most marked, powerful thing that had ever happened in my life. Yeah, we were in the tent at the time. And I remember when I walked up there and I said those words, the part of the words that I will always remember is that I will live for you from this day forward. I remember saying that. I will live for you from this day forward. And you're panting and sobbing, not because you wanted to cry. You don't even know where did the tears come from? Where did any of that happen? But when I left and I was walking up that street, I knew that I was a new person. Something had happened that had not happened before. Yeah? And that is, that is the, the marvel of it. So, when, um, when the scripture says that all concluded on the sin, you don't retain the guilt of it if you genuinely saved. It doesn't matter what you did. That is what the grace that Jesus gave, it erased the guilt, the weight of guilt. Guilt has a weight on it. Yeah? And some people who don't know how to really just receive that salvation because it is by faith. If you come up and say the sinner's prayer, this is what I tell you. Sometimes the whole sinner's prayer thing could be a little bit of a myth. Eh? Because people come up, you say that prayer and you say it without faith. It's, it's, it's worth nothing. There are people who didn't say a sinner's prayer, but they stepped into Christ. Right? Because remember, sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. Eh? I know people get upset for that. But sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. They just kind of try to formalize something to tell you in this moment in time, you could give your heart to the Lord with this. But the sinner's prayer is not there. What is there is it says that if you believe in your heart, right, and you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you believe in your heart unto righteousness, you confess with your mouth unto salvation. So, so you could say, what are you confessing? The sinner's prayer? Really, it is a confession of faith. Right? Which doesn't necessarily have to be in the form of a sinner's prayer. It is in the form, but the evidence will be there. If you did it, what Apostle shared on Sunday, the evidence will be there. Apostle never said a sinner's prayer. Yeah? He had an experience with the Lord. His confession and how he lived that out, because that's your confession. How you live it out. What you say to people concerning Jesus after that. You know, your lifestyle now starts to speak of what you have done. In the Bible, the disciples, they believed, so they followed. And what did they say? When they saw them, they knew that they had been with Jesus. There was evidence that they had been with Jesus. Not because they repeated a prayer. Right? No, I'm not saying it is not a good thing to say the prayer. The prayer is just 
giving people an opportunity, a moment in time where you could say, I am making a confession of faith here, right? But if you do that without faith, it, it profits nothing, right? You just come up and you said some words and people make other people feel that there's this, these miracle words you could say without faith and it's going to transform you. That's not how it works. You have to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that true accepting him saying you know what i believe what they're saying here that you did and i want you to be my savior and i am ready to follow you which means you know what following him meant they left the life that they were living before and they followed him it was literally they walked away from the life that they had before and they followed him. If Jesus were to walk in here now and you say, and he said, do you believe that I am the Lord? And you say, yes, he says, follow me. You will walk away from what you have known and you don't go back to it. You follow him. So understand that is where true confession is when you follow him. Yeah follow him and the evidence that that old life no longer has that hold on you will say that you there's that that is your confession that is your confession yeah so there has to be that genuine that genuine turn away and that is when you feel the guilt of sin lift because literally um in the old testament when they would sacrifice the bulls and the goats and all these things for, for their sin, the scripture says that they retained the guilt. There was a remembrance of the guilt every single year. The remembrance of the guilt. Believers need to, by faith, know when you accepted Jesus Christ, by faith, your sins were blotted out. Yeah. Blotted out. Not to be remembered. Again, it was blotted out. Yeah, so this is, the, this is the kind of thing. So he says, the scripture says that all have been concluded under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them. How? To them that believe. You have to believe. Yeah, you have to believe. Right? I don't want you to leave here saying, Reverend Martin, I said, don't say no sinners pray. But I'm saying, it is worth nothing if you're not saying it. Believe in. You'll have more success actually just walking in faith, <laughs> believe in Jesus Christ, than uttering some words that you don't believe. Yeah? And if we're not careful, sometimes we make ourselves very religious too, eh? We create our own religious rituals. We're talking about all these people who create rituals and, and stuff. And if we're not careful, Christendom could become very ritualistic and very religious. Yeah? Because you forget the essence of what it is. If I believe Jesus, follow him. Don't go back to your sin. Walk with him. Peter and they, they were transformed over time, but they did not go back to their old life. You could imagine you saying, Jesus, I'm following you. He meets you as a drunkard, but you're still there guzzling your thing. You say, yeah, I'm following Jesus. You could barely talk because your word's slow. And I'm like, following, I'm a follower of Jesus. Yeah? You're a cuss, bud. You say you're following Jesus, but you're still cussing. You know, we did a thing with the young adults. You see where I can't finish? Well, I'm going to finish it, you know. We did a thing with the young adults where um, we, there was this guy. I wonder if I shared this already, but there was this guy. He started a program and stuff. He was newly saved. He started this program and he just felt like, you know, he, he normal everyday language. He would curse and whatever and stuff. And so in his program, even though he got saved, he didn't find anything wrong with the language that was normal for him. And so in his program, he cursing hands down, using language by talking about, about the Lord, right? So these other people, they were doing a little um, talk show thing together. And so one of the girls asked, so what about, um, how do you feel about the, the cursing? So he's like, 
know how he said people I'm relatable, you know. People could relate to me because I'm using the same language that they do. He, and he's saying he's, you know, Peter was a um a fisherman, so he, he was cussing like a fisherman, right? So the girls they were saying, they said, you know, when we started our thing too, because where they are from, cursing one was from Armenia and, and stuff, and they said, you know, it's like everyday language for them to use like F word, everything is normal. And she said, for the first time in her life, she had decided to do um, a fast. I think it was a three-day fast. And when she did the three-day fast, she said it was wonderful. First time in her life doing it. She said for the first time, she was talking to a friend after the fast. She was talking to a friend on the phone. And normal conversation and the friend cursed. And she said for the first time in her life, everything in her cringed when she heard the word. And she was like, oh, what was that? So she tried to ignore it. She was like, yeah, you know, and you're going on with life. Then she realized that she's so, no, she can't say the words anymore. So she's spelling it, <laughs> right? You're so what to use it. You're spelling it now because you're telling yourself you, you don't feel like you could do it anymore. But she said that started to show her that somehow something is off with this language. So when the guy is listening to her now, because remember, he's doing this problem. He feel like, you know, I'm relatable, whatever. He heard that and he was such a sweet soul. When he heard her say that, he said, just need to step back a little bit. He says, you said something there that really hit me. He said, you said that when your friend cursed, you cringed. He said, I don't want to make anybody cringe. You know, he said, I, I, that's not who I want to be. So it hit home for him. And he said, you know what? I'm making a decision today. From today. I'm going to stop cursing. He said, I may slip up sometimes, but he said, I'm going to, I'm making a decision that that's not going to be who I am. But what was so beautiful that the girl shared? She said, you know, when Peter, when he was following Jesus and they, they took Jesus because they were going to crucify him and the people saw him and they said, he is one. Look, this is one who was with with Jesus, and Peter was like, no, it's not me. I'm telling you, it's not me. And, then, and he said it one time, and they said, another one turned up and said, yes, look at him. He's one. He's one of them Galileans and things. He said, it's not me. When Peter wanted to show that he was not associated or affiliated with Jesus, it said he cursed. So one of the ways for you to show that you are not part of the people who follow Jesus Christ is using foul language. I found that that was one of the greatest arguments I ever heard concerning this. To dissociate yourself from the Lord is language. So how you could be saying, I genuinely accepted the Lord and whatever. He meets you as a cuss, and you're still cussing. Something has to happen. Because the spirit of the Lord, bitter water and fresh water cannot be coming out of the same fountain. Yeah? So, so that salvation needed to take place. So, I said all that to say, guilt of sin has to lift. It has to be a genuine experience. And as Apostle said, there has to be evidence. And the evidence is a changed life. There has to be change. Or else really, you need to question what you did. So Romans chapter 3 and verse 21, it says... I'll give you a chance to get there. When it says that it concluded all under sin. Get there quickly. Romans 3 and verse 21 it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It says even the righteousness of God, which is how? By faith of Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. He says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody. Whether you were following the law or whatever. He says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by what? By his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, they even the playing field so that nobody starts off at a higher place than anybody. Everybody starts off as a sinner. Jew, Gentile, everybody, you are a sinner 
forget your pride. Whether you're rich, you're poor, regardless of your status in life, you could have accomplished great things and you're so educated, you're still a sinner. You could have been brought up in religion and all of that, doing holy things, you're still a sinner. It says, forget all of that, throw away everything and start over. Because until you meet Jesus Christ, you cannot be saved from any sin because he's the only one that qualified to take it. Right? So all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is something that could irritate the living daylight out of religious people, I'm telling you. To tell you after all my piety, you know how much candle I burn, you know how much thing I do, and you want to tell me now I am a sinner? <laughs> yeah? You know how much pilgrimage I do? You know, how much money I spend to go here, there, and everywhere. You know, they have all the religious sites. You spend all your money and go, and now you want to tell me I am a sinner? Those Jewish people, they buy the wailing wall, crying out for Jesus all the time. You don't have people more dedicated. Listen, Paul said, I bear you witness. He says that you have a zeal of God. If zeal could have saved some people, you know how many people will be saved? Because you're, you're, you're zealous. For, for what you're doing, for your religion, sell us. Yeah, look at Paul. Paul was ready to kill anybody who wasn't following the, the, the way, you know. And all, all that zeal, he said, by bear you witness, you have a zeal for God. He says, but it's not according to knowledge. He said, because you not embracing God's righteousness, you have gone now to, to establish your own righteousness. And have not submitted unto the righteousness of God. And what is the righteousness of God? Jesus Christ. He said you have to submit. Everybody has to now submit to Jesus. Regardless of what you were doing. Whether it's Buddha, Krishna, whoever. Everybody now. He says forget what you were doing. And come to Jesus. Because all have sinned. And there's one savior. So everybody has to come to this one savior. We come into a time, eh, people, where we're going to have to speak these words bold. And, and you see these last days? We're going to have to speak it out. Whether we get stoned, we get shot, we get whatever. Because we're going to have to speak for the Lord. Somebody sent a video of somebody who had this experience with... I don't know, was it a dream they had? I think it was a dream that they had. And they think they were, they, they, oh, it was a dream where people were raptured and stuff. They, they said that they saw themselves, some people were raptured and they stayed back. And when they asked the Lord, but why would I stay back? They and all their friends, plenty of people in their congregation stayed back. Why are, we, why are we here? They said, because you didn't speak the plain truth with the people around you. You did not tell them, you didn't speak out when you had opportunity to tell people that this was wrong. Change your life. Do these things. You didn't do it. Even with each other. Even with each other in the church. You know, you don't call sin, sin. Yeah? You're calling the sin a little misdemeanor. But I know you have struggles. Listen, it has struggles, it has weakness, and it has sin. Because struggling is not sin, you know. Sin is sin. Yeah? Weakness is not the sin. The sin is the sin. <laughs> yeah? And you know what is the scriptures in the Bible that say? When Paul said that a brother who is a fornicator, so he said, I tell you not to eat. You know, you're not even supposed to sit down and dine with the fornicator. You're supposed to let the fornicator know the ways and, and stuff like that. But we rubbing shoulders thing and because i know you have a weakness you're living a lifestyle he wasn't talking about somebody who fell into sin that's not what he's talking about he's talking about somebody who has made a decision to live in that state yeah this is not your fall into sin you were doing good and anything and then you end up falling and you and you shun your brother no it's somebody who when you tell him you know you, the, the lifestyle does not measure up with who Christ is. But you still choose to stay in the lifestyle. He says, do company with them. No, if you do that, they'll be like, oh, you're just too religious. And whatever, but the Bible tell you not to company with them. Yeah? The serious business. Yeah? So, all have sinned and come short. Going to verse 23 of Galatians 3 now. It says, but, so all have been concluded right? Under sin, he says. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. 
So he just explained everything that I've spoken about over the last few weeks. Before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. He said it was blocked off from us. We did not have access to that faith. He said, but no, the time has changed. They were under the law because Christ had not come yet. That was not released. The grace was not available yet. Right? It was blocked off from you. Verse 24. He says, wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. You had a schoolmaster. Listen to how it says it in the Amplified. It says, with the result that the law has become our tutor and our disciplinarian to guide us to Christ so that we may be justified. That is declared free of the guilt of sin and its penalty and placed in right standing with God by faith. You see, the guilt of sin and the penalty of sin must leave you. It doesn't matter what you did in your past. When you come to Jesus Christ by faith, that guilt and the penalty of that. Let's say you were an adulterer or whatever. You came to Christ. As far as he's concerned, you are no longer an adulterer. Even if somebody comes up to you and say, but you weren't the one who was doing that. Let's say you were a prostitute or whatever. You were doing so and so. That. None of that is relevant. Because you came to Christ and the guilt and the penalty for that sin has been wiped out. You have to receive that by faith or else you could never be saved. If you cannot believe that what Jesus Christ did took away that sin, then you're not a believer. Then you're, therefore you're not saved. If you're retaining the guilt of sin, you have not embraced the beauty of the cross and what was accomplished. That is where the faith is. It's not just in saying, I believe. It's not saying that I believe that Jesus once walked upon the earth. You know how much people believe that? The historians believe that. Yeah? The people in other faiths, they believe it, but they don't believe that it was the Jesus who, who um, they believe he was a prophet and all these things. Right? So a lot of people believe that the devil believes Jesus. Yeah? So it's not just that you believe it that way, but you have to embrace the price that was paid enough to give your life to follow him. Amen? So he says, it was a disciplinarian that was in place until you could embrace all of this and be justified. Justified means, remember they used to tell us sometimes, justified means it's just as if you never sinned. Being justified is just as if you've never sinned. That is what Jesus did for us. Verse 25 says, But after that faith has come, we are no longer under our schoolmaster. In other words, they're trying to tell the Jews, give up the law, let it go. There is no righteousness to be had there. You could kill all your goats and whatever. From now on, you're concluded under sin. You will still be a sinner. The blood of goats and things no longer covering your sin. It's not covering it for a year because God now has put a mediator in place. And that sheep or that goat or that animal is no longer mediating for you. If you don't come to Jesus Christ, you retain your sin. That's what he was telling them. He said, no, um, we are no longer under schoolmaster. The law is like preschool. It's like primary school. You know, some people when they're going through preschool and it's time to graduate to go to primary school, they're trying to hold on to your small desk and say, no, I don't want to go. When some of our young people need to graduate from Sunday school to come upstairs, they're kind of like they want to stay down. They're all 13, 14. They want to be still down in Sunday school, you know. They don't want to graduate. That is how the law was for these people and is, still is, because they're still holding on to the law, right? They don't want to graduate. It's like, you know, where do your children go to the pediatrician? They go into the pediatrician since they're babies. And then they reach all 17, 18. You're supposed to graduate to the big people doctor. I remember when I said, carry Joshua to the pediatrician. I see these big horses coming in. I, I tell myself, where are they going? They come to see, <laughs> they come to see the pediatrician. <laughs> what do you think happened? 
they're big now, they reach 18, but they, they don't want to let go of their pediatrician because this is the doctor who gave them the lollipop. When they give them the injection, they get a lollipop, they get a little hug up and they love up and stuff, and they don't ever want to leave the pediatrician. When you tell them, go to another doctor, no, <laughs> yeah? But the pediatrician now have to sit down and say, yeah, you're way too big now, you can't fit on my table. <laughs> Yeah, you need to go to a big people doctor. This is exactly what happened to the people. So they had to say, the law was a schoolmaster. But you don't need it anymore. You need to graduate because what the law was a placeholder for has now come. Get rid of the placeholder. You cannot fall in love with the placeholder. Like so many people fall in love with the shadow. The real thing has come, but you're in love with the shadow of things to come. Yeah, that's what the law is like too. You're in love with the shadow, but the real person there. You can imagine you're there, you're romancing a shadow, and the real person standing up there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> romance the real person. <laughs> yeah, you still want to see the person. You're talking to them however long. You're only seeing them on Zoom and 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 video chatting. When the person's still there, you want to still be talking to them on the video chat. They're right there. Talk to the person <laughs> right there. But we get accustomed to things, right? So this is the struggle of the Jews. So the scripture says, they're no longer under the schoolmaster, no longer under the law. The law could do nothing for you now. Verse 26, he says, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Listen to how you become a child of God. Only by faith in Christ Jesus. You will hear people saying, we are all children of God. We are not. And that's the other thing people don't like to hear, you see. Because everybody said, but we are all God's children. We are not. They even have songs about it. That we are all God's children. We are not. It says, we are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's how you qualify to be a child of God. Children of God have to be born of God. You can't be somebody's child if you're not born of them. You have to be born of God, right? We are only born again by faith in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, verse 14 to 17. Let me just read it because we're running out of time. Romans 8, 14 to 17. Hear what it says. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? They are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. When the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of adoption, comes, we find ourselves crying, Abba, Father, Daddy, God, because we finally found our Father. You finally became a child of God. So the spirit now stirs you and you find yourself crying, Abba, Father. You're no longer fearful because you've found your father. Verse 16 says, the spirit itself, that same spirit of adoption, which is the Holy Spirit, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are what? That we are the children of God. If you don't have that witness, then you're probably not a child of God. The Spirit of God bears witness in our spirit. And all of a sudden you know, God is my Father. Relationship. The, the wedge that was there. The absence of having a Father in your life that was there. That goes away. And you know, because the Spirit of God in you knows, you know to say, Abba Father. Relationship is born. Yeah? Relationship is born. It's like when a newborn child comes into the world and they take that child and they place the child on the chest of the mother. There is a bonding that takes place. That it, It's amazing, really. I'll never forget those two little black beady eyes watching me when they, when they put him there. And, I, you know, you just, he just looks straight into your face. And you know that in that moment, there is a connection that takes place. You know, it doesn't happen for everybody because some people say, I watch a child, a child was like a little rat. 
and whatever, and they didn't feel no connection and all this, and all this thing. That's, that's kind of weird for me. But, you know, but in that moment, there was such a joining that took place. And I remember um, my husband, he was just hours old, and I have a picture of my husband holding him like this, and he stood up and he was looking into his face. And I have that picture because that was their connection that took place. Yeah? That is what happens when we are born again. It's like you, you could connect with your father. And it's a beautiful thing. You didn't even know that that's what you were missing. It continues. It says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God. Because if we figure out that we are children of God, children of who? Just think about whose child you are. It says we are children of God. Capital G-O-D. Yeah? So guess what comes with that? He says, if children, then heirs. You have an inheritance to get. Yeah? Imagine you now find your father. And when you found your father, you realize that your father real rich. Yeah? All the silver, the gold is his. The cattle on all the hills belong to him. Everything that exists in the world belongs to him. And he says, guess what? That's my daddy. That is my father. He says, so if you, are, you figure out that you are children, then you are heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. My goodness. How did we get elevated to such a place that we are joint heirs with Christ? Royalty. That's why he says we are a royal priesthood. Listen, when God starts to blow your mind with, with how he sees us, you know, we still there just groveling down in the earth, still trying to convince ourselves whether we saved or we not saved. We're only there butting your head in the same spot all the time. we like a, a, an iguana, I remember seeing. You run up to the door, you bounce yourself, you come back, you run up into the same door, you bounce yourself. That is how some of us do our Christianity, you know. we just butting your head in the same spot all the time, trying to figure out, am I saved, not saved? Am I saved, not saved? Get ready, program it. Have things to be hard. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Children of God... There are things to be had. There are things to do. You know? Life to live. People to get saved. To know this good news of what we have received. Yeah? All of this to have. He says, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, because it goes with the territory. Right? Because once you go in the way of Christ, you know you have to take up your cross daily. Right? If we suffer with him, that we may also that we may be also glorified together. Amen? It's 732, so I didn't quite finish, but I only have verse 27 to 29 to go. I don't want to rush it down because I have a good thing to talk about with baptism, and I will leave that for, because the next verse is, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We're going to deal with that one. Next week, God willing. Amen? But yes, so we need to know who we are. Children of God. We are not under the schoolmaster. We have been given this access. We have a great mediator, a great high priest, one who, because of him, we could approach the Father. We could talk to him in his name. And you know, speaking in Jesus' name doesn't mean that you have to keep saying, in the name of Jesus. You know, that, that, that's, that's not what that means. When you understand that you are coming in the name of Jesus, it's like without you saying, in the name of Jesus, and the Father knows that you understand your positioning, where Christ is concerned, you don't have to keep saying, in the name of Jesus. He knows that you are coming. And the reason why you're even coming boldly is because you understand that you are in the mediator. When we talk about putting on Christ, you will understand. Yeah? You're coming in the mediator. You're coming in his name. So you don't have to keep saying, um, remember, is Reverend Martinez sent me? I hear any name of Reverend Martinez. Is Reverend Martinez sent me? They say, yeah, we established that. Yeah? Make sure that um, so I could come in this room in the name of Reverend Martinez. He'd be like, yeah, we established that. You come, Reverend Martinez sent you. We get it. <laughs> yeah? So this is how, how it will be. So 
Praise God. I pray that you all receive from this study today. I so enjoyed doing the Bible study. I wish that the whole world could sit down and watch, watch Bible study, but it is what it is. First John chapter 2 and verse 20, that is our memory verse. Not because I want people to see to know. I just find it so enjoyable. I just feel like everybody should just be enjoying it. Yeah? Because you all know, if I get two people sitting down here, I still teach and I still, I'm still just as excited. It don't matter. <laughs> it don't matter. It could be 10,000 people watching. It could be two people and I am just as happy because I get the joy out of doing it. Yeah? So 1 John 2 and verse 20, it says, but you have an unction. Apostle did the scripture on Sunday and I just fell in love with it. You have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. If you see, we only unpack that verse of scripture. Try and unpack it. Go and read it in different translations and thing and unpack it and see how much you could get from it. That is how, when we're doing these verses, make sure you could glean from it. You mightn't remember to say the the and the and and the whatever, but if you could capture the essence of the verse, you know what it says, you'd be able to quote it in a sense because you could tell people more than just the words, you could tell them what it means. Amen? Praise God. Let's stand. Precious, precious, wonderful Lord, we are so thankful to you for the beauty of your word. We are thankful, oh God, that we could sit, we could study it, because when we get into your word, oh God, your word is light, and your word is life. And Father God, it's like we get an opportunity to just swim in you, to just discover, to just bask in you when we get into your word and we are just thankful for the opportunity precious lord let us never lose the hunger and the thirst for your word the hunger and thirst to know you more to learn of you father let our appetites be always open lord let us never father god go on to other things that other things would seem to be more valuable than eating with you dining with you fellowshipping with you oh god even in your word we bless you, we honor you, and we thank you for the great privilege. In Jesus' precious name, take us home safely, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you all. Have a wonderful evening. And see you on the, in, for the weekend, the weekend services, and next week for Bible study. God bless you. Bless those of you online. Introducing the Know the Truth series by Dr. Austin DeBoog. It will open your eyes to God's truth on four misunderstood and misrepresented Christian teachings. Saints Conferring sainthood upon dead people contradicts God's word. Communion Infinitely more than a mundane ritualistic tradition. The Church God's Church is not a man-made religion. And Praying versus Saying Prayers Praying as Jesus taught is not just reciting someone else's words. If you think wrong, you will believe wrong and you will act wrong. Too many of us are accepting wrong Christian beliefs. This blinds us to the truth of God's infallible word and robs us of God's abundant blessings. This book series challenges you to take a closer look at what you've been taught. It will revolutionize your thinking. It is time to know the truth. Another way.